Yes, Virginia, this is a podcast. We're your hosts, Leslie and Jamie. Episode 2, in Dulce Jubilee. This episode is coming out to you on Wednesday, the 2nd of December, 2020. Hi, well, welcome back to Yes, Virginia, this is a podcast, or Yiftiap, as we've taken to calling it amongst ourselves. This week, we are talking about the history of Christmas, which is a massive subject and which I worked hard to distill into well, hopefully what is going to be about five minutes, probably will be longer, but we'll see. I have a special interest in the history of Christmas, which I've been researching for years, uh, nearly decades now. So a lot of this, um, it, it was difficult to distill sort of my knowledge um, on these subjects down, but I tried to pick out the most interesting, relevant uh, bits. And uh, much of the history of Christmas will come through when we talk about various other topics on uh, different weeks. Yes, it's obviously a lot of time period to cover. Um, Christmas is such a broad subject. Last last episode, yesterday, we talked about um, the birth story of Jesus, but now we're going to talk about Christmas itself, the celebration, um, and how that has evolved over the years, over the centuries. And we'll be taking you from medieval times up to the present day. And this will inevitably have an Anglo-American bias, well, basically because we're an Anglo-American couple, but also because the way Christmas is celebrated in a globalized manner today owes much to uh, an Anglo-American tradition. Uh, and it will come from sources such as Neil Armstrong's Christmas in the in 19th century England, Mark Connolly's Christmas, A Social History, Golby and Perdue's The Making of the Modern Christmas, Ronald Hutton's The Rise and Fall of Merry England, The Ritual Year, 1400 to 1700, Unwrapping Christmas, uh, which is a series of essays edited by Daniel Miller, Pimlet's The Englishman's Christmas, A Social History, Penne L. L. Restrade's Christmas in America and Christmas at the Movies. So Neil Armstrong, the guy who went to the moon? Or different Neil Armstrong? Di di different Neil Armstrong, right. yeah. Okay. So yeah. we'll start um, a good thousand years after the birth of Christ uh, with medieval, a uh, very general introduction to medieval Christmas. So Christmas as celebrated in medieval England included carols, feasting, games, the giving of alms, so charity for the poor, basically, the performance of miracle plays, which we'll talk about in more detail uh, in a future episode, the use of evergreens to decorate, which again, we'll talk about more in the weeks, uh, sorry, in the days about uh, the episodes on the flora of Christmas, and also the Christmas tree. And um, it also introduced the concept of the creche, that is the nativity scene, as well as St. Stephen's Day. So all things we'll go into more detail about in future episodes. So medieval folk could look forward to feast days, of which Christmas was one, uh, when there were church services in the morning and leisure in the afternoon, something they, they rarely would have. Uh, during the year. Also, December was kind of like the jackpot in terms of feast days. There were so many feast days in the medieval uh, English calendar, uh, including the 4th of December being the Feast of St. Barbara, the 6th being the Feast of St. Nicholas, which we'll get into more detail uh, on the 6th of December when we uh, talk about Father Christmas, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, and his many aspects. On the 7th of December is the Feast of St. Ambrose, the 8th, the Feast of the Conception of Our Lady, the 13th, the Feast of St. Lucy, which I think, again, we're talking about a little bit in a future episode, 21st, St. Thomas the Apostle, 26th, St. Stephen the Martyr, uh, St. Stephen's Day, 27th, St. John the Apostle, 28th, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, uh, the 29th, uh, the Feast of St. Thomas the Archbishop, and the 31st, uh, the Feast of St. Sylvester the Pope and Confessor. And in France, um, that's still uh, celebrated more than um, New, Year's, New Year's Eve. It's the Feast of saint Sylvestre. Mm. So, um, so again, it was, this, it was this time to sort of let your hair down and enjoy, and it was over a prolonged period. It wasn't just Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. It was... It was more like at least 12 days. At least 12 days. And obviously back then, no electricity and no modern comforts. The winters were cold and long. Uh, the only way of lighting your home would be with candles. Candles so, or yeah. um, like animal fat. Yeah. So it would be a real, it would be you know, a real time where you could barely work. You were very cold. 
And so having festivals or feasts, as they were, would be a real uh, opportunity to to get through that really dark period. Correct. Although though we, we know that that's the case, there are very few documented accounts of what actually went on in these medieval feasts, exactly what they ate and sort of what the entertainment was. Uh, we do know there are traditions of boy bishops, um, so which is analogous to on Epiphany finding you know the bean or the coin in your piece of cake and you're, you get to be the king or queen for the day. So it's this kind of idea of mis- age of misrule and uh, reversals, like the children become the, the bishops for a day. And then apprentices uh, could engage in card playing, bowls, which is like bowling, uh, and, and tennis, which they were forbidden from doing the rest of the year. So again, it was really a case of really making merry during this period. But on the flip side of that was those who were better off, the gentry, were supposed to open their houses to the poor during this period. Uh, And uh, whether they actually did, it really differed from sort of household to household. So, you know, you hear these days that Christmas isn't like it used to be. And you can actually trace that saying or that feeling all the way back to medieval times because there always seemed to be a movement telling the gentry to be more giving and hospitable with their Christmas celebrations. You know, it's not like it used to be. Celebrate Christmas like you used to celebrate it. Uh, and, and telling the gentry to open their halls in the true spirit of Christian generosity. Thomas Tusser records this in the mid-16th century with a little poem that goes, At Christmas we banquet the rich and the poor, who then but the miser but openeth his door. So this idea that you really should fulfill the the Christian uh, charitable aspect of the season and and give to those less fortunate. In the 17th century, many of the customs that had been associated with Christmas continued and we become more defined over the centuries to come. We start to see the beginning of Boxing Day as a, a, a real Christmas uh, part of celebration. And it was common practice in those days for apprentices and servants to ask their masters or their master's customers for money at Christmas time. That's uh, something which still continues in and one form or another. That That's where you get the beginning of Boxing Day because this the, the, the money that they requested uh, would be put into something like a box and that's we'll talk about it more um probably when we get to dickens in the 19th century as this uh becomes more solidified also in uh, the the 17th century so scotland was uh, very reform-minded um they thought that celebrating christmas was far too catholic and um, by 1583, Scottish Presbyterians had decided that there was no biblical reason to celebrate Christmas, and therefore it would remain a working day for them. And this actually continued all the way up until 1958. So you still find, you know, it's been my experience that a lot of Scottish people, maybe they don't celebrate, well, they celebrate Christmas perhaps, but it's never as important as New Year's Hogmanay. And I think it's partially for this reason. Another sort of famous period of English history, uh, the English Civil War, uh, Charles I and the Cavaliers and Roundheads. Um, And that was a period in which uh, it was actually against the law to celebrate Christmas once the uh, Puritans had won uh, the Civil War. It was illegal for churches to be open on Christmas Day unless Christmas Day happened to fall on a Sunday. It was illegal for mince pies to be eaten, and it was illegal for people to celebrate Christmas or decorate their homes. So people actually did go around inspecting to see whether or not anybody had holly or ivy or mistletoe, any of the things we actually associate with Christmas and associated with Christmas back then. Interestingly enough, although King George I reinstated mince pies as part of Christmas celebrations in 1714, Parliament never actually officially repealed the ban, so it is technically illegal to eat mince pies and plum puddings at Christmas time in the UK. So we are we are real felons at Christmas because of all the mince pies that we eat. <laughs> Despite uh, popular belief that uh, this was a general um, Puritan crackdown, it wasn't specifically... Uh, Oliver Cromwell himself. This was part of a, a much wider movement. So, yeah, you get this sense uh, in much of history that it, it, it was personally him. He had this personal grudge against Christmas, but that's not the case. It was part of this, this reform-minded movement of, well, it doesn't say in the Bible that you should celebrate this feast of Christmas. So uh, 
um, there's no there's no biblical reason to do it, therefore we won't. I mean, people were unhappy with it. They didn't just uh, roll over and take it. So people were clandestinely uh, celebrating Christmas where they could. And this did sometimes lead to quite violent confrontations uh, between ordinary people who wanted to celebrate Christmas and the law enforcement officials of the time. Things changed with the Restoration. That was when uh, Charles II was restored to the throne uh, of England and Scotland. Um, he was educated in France in exile during the, the, the Civil War. Uh, and he really revived the tradition of big parties, balls, uh, and during the 12 days of Christmas in a very sort of grandiose style. Continuing as well, the, the uh, celebration of alms giving and um, many of the days um, around Christmas were still celebrated as uh, holidays. Uh, quite a long period, not just 12 days of Christmas. We're now talking celebrations lasting until Plough Monday, which is the first Monday after Twelfth Night, or even Candlemas, which is February the 2nd. So even in sort of late medieval um, 17th century, uh, Candlemas was considered the very last day you could keep your Christmas decorations up. And that leads us into the 18th century, which actually was a very quiet time for Christmas celebrations. Uh, you don't find very many new traditions being made that would carry over to our times. You don't find a lot of uh, accounts, uh, at least really from middle class people, um, talking about their Christmas celebrations. Uh, Neil Armstrong, the aforementioned Neil Armstrong, uh, explained this. He sort of he theorized that it was due to a disproportionate number of families in trade who were Protestant nonconformists, so not Church of England. Uh, and he sort of argued that Baptists and Quakers especially rejected the significance of Christmas for the reasons we've sort of explained. And of course, as we said, in, in Scotland, um, it didn't have uh, as much significance at all in terms of being considered a, a holiday. And this uh, carries over to the North American content with the, the the Puritans, again, celebrating their Christmas usually by working uh, and not setting it apart as a, as a day. It would be considered a day like any other. And in colonial Williamsburg, uh, where they were not nonconformists, they tended to be from Ang Anglican backgrounds. Christmas was still spent fairly quietly at home in prayer and reflection with uh, a trip to church for communion. So there were not these feasts that you find in the medieval period. And it's very different from 19th century celebrations of Christmas. But you do get a few traditions that originate from the 18th century uh, in England, such as kissing under the mistletoe and the invention of pantomime, which we'll talk about in uh, one of our upcoming episodes, and also the tradition of playing charades at Christmas. And that's, again, of sort of a Regency thing. That's the kind of thing you look at... Um, Jane Austen or her relatives writing about playing charades um, mm. sort of between Christmas and, and Twelfth Night. And Twelfth Night was definitely celebrated in the 18th century more than Christmas itself was uh, due to all of this, um, all these parties. And then you can also add one more uh, fact to Christmas in the 18th century. So Christmas pudding as we know it, which again, we'll talk about Christmas pudding a bit more in our episode on uh, sweets. Um, so Christmas pudding, as we know, it was first first appeared in the reign of King George III, and it's said to have been invented especially for him because of his inordinate love of English puddings. Okay, and that leads us into the 19th century, and the 19th century is really where we get most of our current traditions in the Anglo-American, now globalized Christmas. And I'm not going to go into too much detail here because so much of it hinges on Dickens and what he brought to Christmas celebrations. So I will go over that um, in a subsequent episode. It's something that I know I'm very fascinated by and I know a lot about. So I will save that for another episode. I'll just say that there are really marked differences between the uh, beginning of the 19th century and after the publication of A Christmas Carol, which is 1843. Uh, you really before that, it's very much this 18th century, very quiet version of Christmas, and it goes through a, a definite metamorphosis, um, sort of 1840s onwards. Part of this is to do, so we're saying we had, you know, you could consider celebrating Christmas 
from sort of late de- mid to late December all the way up into February 2nd, Candlemas. But between 1790 and 1840, there was a marked pruning of holidays surrounding Christmas um, in Britain. Um, so that was that's one one way it changed. In the 1840s, there's also a particular British Christmas iconography that's developing. And this is, again, it's, it's in flux. So it starts to having to do with sort of uh, this tradition of wassail and, and drinking spirits, making merry, more of this medieval feasting archetype with the pledging cup. And then it disappears um, as the century goes on, as Christmas becomes a more child-centered holiday. And that um, also feeds into this idea of the popularization of Father Christmas and Santa Claus, which again, we'll cover in a later episode. So that brings us into the 20th century. So one of the um, big inventions of the early 20th century, obviously, was radio, which is Leslie's speciality, as she mentioned in an earlier episode. So carols could first be heard being broadcast uh, on the radio as early as 1906 from experimental radio in Massachusetts, and this could be heard by passing ships. And then Christmas carols became a staple of BBC radio broadcasting from 1923 onwards. In 1926, we saw the BBC play uh, by the Reverend Bernard Walker, a nativity play called Bethlehem. It was so popular that it was broadcast every Christmas for nine years afterwards. We also have the Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols. This was based on a Truro service from the year 1880, but it was popularised at King's College, Cambridge in 1918. The BBC took it up in 1928, and it was broadcast on MBS in the USA in 1938. It is still broadcast annually on Christmas Eve on BBC Radio and the World Service, and picked up in the USA, broadcast by at least 400 local radio stations. One of the most famous events Christmas related in the early 20th century was the Christmas truce in 1914. This was during World War I. On Christmas Eve, the Germans and the English and the French as well, they started singing Christmas carols to each other. And then slowly, tentatively, they started leaving the trenches, putting the weapons down and um, walking across no man's land, embracing each other, talking to each other exchanging gifts and it was really quite phenomenal it's something that's really lasted in the cultural memory and people always talk about that magic christmas when you know in the depths of one of the most bloodiest wars in human history the two sides came together this was of course was the ordinary infantry you know the non-commissioned officers the people at the very sharp end the front lines as it were uh, as it literally as it was um, it wasn't at all popular with those higher up. And they thought that it would be very hard for people to shoot each other if they were previously getting too friendly. So it was considered not treasonous as such, but a, a criminal in the sense of fraternising with the enemy. So although there were hopes that there may be another Christmas truce the following year, there were great efforts to squash that and it never happened again, really on a, on a mass scale in the First World War or at all in the Second World War. There have always been localised truces around these sorts of times of the year uh, in both of those wars, but never on such a large scale as was experienced in 1914. We'll, in a later episode, talk about film and TV, but obviously the advent invention of film and television has had a real impact on Christmas. Uh, the invention of the Christmas movie as a real staple of the genre um, obviously has contributed to how we understand Christmas, how we celebrate Christmas and has contributed to a lot of the Christmas iconography that we're familiar with and a lot of the traditions we're familiar with. I'm sure that there are many people out there uh, listening who will have a favourite Christmas movie or they will have Christmas movies that they watch regularly at Christmas each year. We certainly have uh, certain films or TV shows that we specifically make an effort to watch each year. There are some that perhaps we don't go out of our way to do, but they will be definitely on TV and you'll probably, if you're around, you'll catch it. Uh, And it will vary from household to household. I mean, there's this whole debate um, about whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie or not, and that's perhaps saved for another time. But this is uh, the kind of thing that we're, we're talking about. And it's really um, given us an idea of how people can celebrate Christmas. There's this uh, quote from one of uh, the books that Leslie has uh, cited. It says, uh, in 1884, we 
will have no idea how the majority of people in Britain spent their time at 8pm. But 100 years later, in 1984, we can say definitely that 70% of the population were watching TV and 40% were watching Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, so today's carol that I'll be giving some history and context is in Dolce Jubilo. And it's one of the oldest and most famous of the macaronic carols. And you may be wondering what on earth is a macaronic carol. It has nothing to do with macaroni. First question I was going to ask, what is a macaronic carol? <laughs> it means that it's sung in Latin and a vernacular language. So in the case of Indulce Jubilo in German. And this is because um, it was written by a Dominican monk named Heinrich Suso, or Sus, uh, who was German. Um, in 1328, he had a vision where angels were dancing and singing these words uh, in dolce jubilo, which means in sweet jubilation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, I, I, I like the story behind this carol, uh, this idea that it came, came in this vision uh, with angels dancing. And the tune, um, we can date it back to a manuscript from around 1400. So it's in the collections of Leipzig University Library. Uh, It's in the same collection as the Carol Joseph Lieber, Joseph Mine, which is another sort of beloved, um, older German carol. Uh, Although the tune could be older than 1328, it's just, it's difficult to authenticate that. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a really nice carol, Uh, and unusual because it's been beloved by both Catholics and Protestants. So obviously created by a a Dominican monk um, before the the Reformation, but um, uh, used in Protestant services as well. So it was uh, published, its first uh, translation in English was uh, published by John Wedderburn in his collection Good and Godly Ballads from around uh, 1540. Uh, It was, there was another English translation in 1708 and another one in 1825. So it was pretty popular. It kept being, um, you know, reproduced and retranslated. Uh, Robert Lucas de Purcell wrote in 1837, there can be no doubt that it is one of those old Roman Catholic melodies that Luther, on account of their beauty, retained in the Protestant service. So it is this, it's kind of the same uh, sentiment as the Christmas truce, this idea that across our, our various differences we can still uh, find common ground over this this particular carol. Um, and Bach and Michael Pretorius um, both wrote settings of it, so it is it has been very popular um, since the 14th century. Now the version you're most likely to know it in English, if you know it at all, is the, the version uh, with lyrics by Reverend John Mason Neal, who we'll talk about more Um, in subsequent episodes, he of Good King Wenceslas fame. Um, So his translation is uh, called Good Christian Men Rejoice. He wrote that in 1853, and his version gained popularity after the 1860s, and that's why uh, we sort of, in English, we we know that one the best, although former British Prime Minister um, Edward Heath called it the most horrible version. Mm. And then interestingly, uh, at a gathering of the Moravian Mission in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in 1745, it was reported that Indulce Jubilo was sung simultaneously in 13 European and Native American languages. Mm. Uh, and when you you know look it up, if you're not familiar with it, um, have a look on YouTube and try to find Mike Oldfield's version, uh, which sometimes goes up on YouTube and sometimes they take it down, but if you're lucky and you can find it, um, which really does bring the sort of jauntiness to it. Uh, it's a version without lyrics, actually, so it just gives you the tune, and you can sort of imagine angels dancing to that one. Each each episode when I talk about the, the history of the carols, the sources that I'm mainly using uh, are Douglas Anderson's Hymns and Carols of Christmas, which is a fantastic website. It's so detailed, it's so interesting, and he does it all for free. So I highly recommend having a look and even perhaps uh, donating if you feel so moved. And also, um, I found a lot of information from the Oxford Book of Christmas Poems and the, the New Oxford Book of Carols, edited by Hugh Kite and Andrew Parrott, and also the Penguin Book of Carols, edited by Ian Bradley.
So today's film is The Man Who Invented Christmas, and it's that man Dickens again that we keep talking about, and we'll talk about in not only in other episodes, but probably keep coming up in the episode other than just the one about him. So we won't go into too much detail uh, about Dickens now, but it's often said that um, Dickens didn't just revive Christmas traditions, he invented them as well. Um, and this is one of the themes in The Man Who Invented Christmas. It's um, a retelling of A Christmas Carol, but it's done in quite a meta way because it's also the story of Charles Dickens at the time that he's writing A Christmas Carol. And so in his own way, he experiences the ghosts of Christmas past, present and yet to come um, as they visit him as characters that he's writing and struggling with, as well as he tries to come to terms with his own past. I think it's a very beautifully uh, uh, filmed film. Good actors in it. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, again, as I say, my I have a lot of interest in and knowledge of uh, Dickens and A Christmas Carol, and it was very historically accurate. Um, yeah, beautifully filmed and very true to the to the spirit of Dickens uh, writing writing the story in 1843. And again, as you say, sort of the ghosts of his past and those ghosts really haunted him all his life. And um, most people didn't, he, he didn't really talk about them even with his closest friends, mm -hmm. his, his childhood, um, you know, deprivation, his sort of uh, checkered or fraught relationship with his father. Um, and the, the film does go into that. And it's, it's very well written, as you say, very well performed. I can't really think of any problems with it. Yeah, so in, in many ways, Charles Dickens in real life was like a combination of Tiny Tim, Bob Cratchit and Ebenezer Scrooge. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. I've seen this film a couple of times, actually. The last most recent time I watched it very unseasonally. I think it was maybe February or March when I went to visit my cousin, who is also very into Christmas. So I hope she's listening to this podcast. Um, it's based on a book, which neither of us have read, but... Um, we're going to recommend it because if the film's good, we're going to say the book is good and maybe we'll we'll get a hold of it ourselves. Um, at the time we recorded this podcast, it was available to rent on Amazon Prime. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if coming up to Christmas it was on Netflix as well. Certainly I saw it on Netflix. Our TV uh, recommendation uh, is the Christmas special of Horrible Histories. So Horrible Histories, is, for those who don't know, it's a sketch show on Children's BBC. Um, which based on a book series by Terry Deary. Yes, yeah, just trying to think what his name was. It was blanking there for a minute. Terry Deary and um, covers different periods of history uh, and does it in a very funny and accessible way for children. I really recommend the book. So if you can get hold of them, uh, do. But the series really, uh, as well, takes off on the real spirit of the books. Um, it is very funny, and the Christmas special really combines um, telling the story of Christmas in different time periods with also sort of, I mean, what horrible history doesn't shy away from is sort of how ghastly and bloody and uh, ridiculous our history is. Flatulent. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, uh child centric. Full of rats and poo and. Yeah, basically. Um, so yeah, check out the horrible history special. This one in particular has a lot of, um, Christmas carols in it. Um, but, telling you the story behind those carols and um, focusing mainly on carols that we haven't covered in our show. Um, but yeah, really check it out. Uh, it's available on Netflix uh, and likely it could be available on BBC iPlayer. It's repeated pretty frequently. Again, I would be surprised if it wasn't repeated at some point this Christmas. And that leads into our radio drama recommendation for this episode. And like uh, the episode yesterday, it's an episode from Cavalcade of America, the anthology series on uh, old time radio in the US. Um, this episode is called We Came This Way. And I'll just pause a moment to talk about DuPont, which was the commercial sponsor for Cavalcade of America. And they were known as merchant, the Merchant of Death in World War I because uh, they developed the gases that were used to, hmm. um, you know, the mustard gases that maimed and, and killed people in, in the trenches. So uh, when that was all over, they felt they needed to change their image and become much more family friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, wholesome. And to do that, they decided they would uh, commercially sponsor this Cavalcade of America, which 
is supposed to tell um, American stories from American history. Although the one yesterday about the nativity, obviously not a story from American history, but generally they, they were stories uh, from, from American history. And this particular episode is a dramatization of the winter spent in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania in 1777 during the American Revolution. Um, again, this is a, a time period that I know a lot about, so I can say it's reasonably historically accurate. The winter at Valley Forge is often described as the American Army's lowest point. It was not actually the coldest winter of the war. I think that was 1781. Uh, and the soldiers didn't actually drag naked and bloody feet in the snow, as is often depicted. It's a great image, but it w mm. wasn't actually quite that bad. Uh, but it was a low point in morale and a logistical nightmare. And they reached Valley Forge um, towards the in December, and it covered the Christmas period. Um, and the men uh, and some of the officers below the rank of colonel um, had to build their own huts at Valley Forge. So if you can imagine uh, a Pennsylvania winter, December, um, and these men with very poor clothing, um, having to spend their nights in tents until their huts were built. And they started building them during the last weeks of December, and they were only finished by the end of January. So it was a long process. And to quote Thomas Fleming, who wrote an excellent book about Valley Forge, he said, almost all of the soldiers at Valley Forge were in their teens or early 20s, unmarried and poor. And that's the kind of the, the population that this Cavalcade of America episode focuses on. And it's very moving, sort of describing, you know, their, their doubts and being away from their families and, you know, what are they actually fighting for? What are they doing there? So it's, it's historically accurate. It, it covers the, the period at Christmas, although it's not all that Christmassy. So I've, I've picked it more for its historical value rather than its Christmas value. But um, it's also got a parallel in a later episode of Cavalcade of America from 1952, which is called Barbed Wire Christmas, which is about um, prisoners of war in Germany uh, during World War II. And you can probably find it on um, archive.org. So that was episode two. So thank you so much for listening. We hope you learned uh, some things that you perhaps didn't know about Christmas before. And we hope it inspires you and encourages you to go out and learn uh, more yourself and, and read more. Uh, certainly those books that Leslie recommended and we'll put it on the Facebook page as well. So you've got uh, the titles down in full. Um, so you can do your own uh, reading and exploring. Um, and yeah, please tell us uh, what you liked about it, which things sounded the most interesting to you. So we're going to end as we will end all our episodes with a Christmas cracker joke. Um, as said before, I, this is the unscripted part. Leslie doesn't know what's coming. Um, she will try and guess the answer. So far, she's guessed correctly last episode. We'll see if she guessed correctly again and perhaps keep a score. So, Leslie, what is a dinosaur's least favorite reindeer? A dinosaur's least favorite reindeer is Comet because uh, an asteroid crashed into... Well, they think an asteroid crashed into the Earth and it set off a cataclysmic environmental event and killed off the dinosaurs. That was a very thorough answer. I would have accepted <laughs> just Comet. But yes, you're absolutely correct. So you're two for two. And so, yes, well done. Dinosaur's least favorite reindeer is Comet. I think you're starting off with easy ones because normally, <laughs> you, normally you ask me jokes and I never know the answer. So we'll I think I've just been lucky so far. Also... If you'd asked me these when I first came to live in the UK, I wouldn't have gotten any of them because there's a certain logic to the way crackers work, just like cryptic crosswords, and you have to get attenuated to that mm -hmm. kind of logic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've uh, finished, we've done our cracker, and it's time for us to bid you adieu. And so this is the end of our second episode of Yes, Virginia, This is a Podcast. Uh, music was provided by Junior85 uh, under an attribution non-commercial share like 3.0 international license. Sleigh bells were by Gower Music, Gower Music from freesound.org used under a Creative Commons attributions license. And Vortex, Merry Christmas under an attribution non-commercial license also from Free Music Archive. We were your hosts, Jamie Beckwith and Leslie McMurtry. And you were listening to A Lesser of Two Weevils Production 2020. <laughs>